Man, it's good to see you guys. I'm glad you're here this morning. I uh, showed you that video for a reason. I think sometimes we watch videos and we, get, we see these, these terminologies that come on and it says, man, the door is open. We want you to belong. We want you to come in. All you have to do is enter. It's so easy and it's going to be utopian, hum, uh, you know, Christianity and everybody's going to be happy. And, and sometimes, let's just be honest in life, it doesn't feel like that, does it? And you feel like, man, the door to God is just jammed. Maybe the door to the answers that you're looking for in your life is just jammed, and you don't know what to do. You don't know where to go. You, you see all these other people that seem to be having this awesome Christian life, and you're sitting here and you're going, it just seems sometimes like God is silent, like God doesn't want to answer my prayers, like God doesn't want to work in my life, and I don't understand why. What I want to do is I want to take today, and I want to show you why, okay? Okay? I think if a person is honest with themselves, and they're honest with who they are, here's what you'll find in their life if they're struggling to want to know God and to be closer to Him in their life. Number one, they're probably leading their life on their own, and God probably isn't completely leading their life. Number two, they're probably struggling with passions in their life that contradict who they are in God. And number three, the effort that it takes to change what needs to change in your life up to this point, you haven't been willing or maybe um, able in your heart and in your soul to put the effort forward. And what I want to do is I want to take some time in Scripture today, and I want to show you that it can actually happen, but I want to also show you what it's going to take. Everybody have a good week this week? Y'all look a little tired. Everybody a little tired? Yeah? Is this one of those weeks where everybody's just kind of like, ugh. You know what I did this week? You want to hear something funny? This will make you laugh about your pastor. Totally ADD, but... You look like you need to wake up and laugh a little bit. So my Bible, you remember last week I was telling you my Bible was broke and it was falling out? I fixed it. Went to the family dollar and got me a, do got me a dollar's worth of crazy glue. And I, and I crazy glued my Bible together and I was so proud of myself because I did it myself. And, and, it, and it isn't going to come off. And I got all the way done and I opened my Bible to look at it and I went, oh crud, it's upside down. <laughs> and now... It is glued in there with super glue, and it's not coming out. And I go in, I show my wife, and she goes, oh, I'm still putting that on Facebook. <laughs> and I go, well, all right. So sometimes in life, when doors are jammed, <laughs> got to find it. I know it's right side up, so here we go. Sometimes in life, when doors are jammed and they just don't want to seem to open, here's what ends up happening in our lives. We get resentful. We find ourselves frustrated, we become quitters, and we start looking for doors that are easier to open. I don't know about you, but sometimes you'll go, hey, you know what, I've tried in this relationship and I'm just done, this door won't open, I'll go through this one that will. Man, I've tried to be close to God, God doesn't want to be close to me, I can't seem to just break through here, so I'm going to go find something that will fill the void in my life that is easier to push open and that I can function in an easier, more appropriate way. And we find ourselves completely walking away from God in our life. Maybe that's where you find yourself. Maybe in your integrity, you've pushed open an easier door. Maybe in your marriage, you've decided to quit and push open an easier door. Maybe in your walk with God, you know, you've tried. You've tried this Christian thing. You got baptized. You got saved. You did all these things that everybody said you need to do, and you don't feel any closer. And, and you know what? You're ready to just walk away and not come anymore because you've pushed through that door, and it doesn't seem like it wants to open for you. Man, can I just tell you something? We all sit in that seat, and the difference is what I'm going to teach you today out of the Scripture. If you got your Bibles, do me a favor and go to Genesis chapter 32, and we're going to be in verse 30, or we're going to be in verse 22. It's a short piece of Scripture today, but it's going to have a huge effect on us and what I want to show you about it. So, what we're dealing with last week, who did we talk about? Anybody remember? What did we talk about? A bowl of what? A bowl of soup last week, remember? And we talked about what's your bowl of soup? What is that bowl of soup that draws you away from God? And we dealt with Jacob and Esau. Do you remember this? Well, we looked at the Esau side of it, but we did not look at the Jacob side of it. I, I don't want to give extra credit points or anything, but here's the deal. What did we say that Jacob's name was when he came out? Anybody remember that? Anybody? Heel catcher. Yeah, who said that? Oh, Melinda did. Oh, the women's ministry person, of course. Thank you for being there. Just sit right here. I'll get you a microphone. Um, no, I'm kidding. It, it, it's heel catcher. Or a, another terminology for that word is deceiver. That was how Jacob was known from the moment he came out 
of the womb. He was a heel-catching deceiver. He was the person who was going to get by, who was going to shove open an easier door, who was going to control his life, who had passions that were opposite of God and was not interested in taking God's route to get to him. Now, Jacob, Jacob, excuse me, Jacob lived his entire life this way. If you know the rest of the story of Jacob and Esau, you'll know that his mom was a total enabler in his life, helped him to be this lying deceiver, and she actually taught him how to put hair on his body so that when he went to get the birthright from his dad, his dad was actually thinking it was his brother. And he lived his entire life as a deceiver, as a person who was always trying to get by, always looking for the easy door to open, always chasing after another passion. Can I ask you an honest question? Right now in your life, is Jesus your passion? Or would you say, man, I have a lot of passions. Jesus is just one of the things in the box of, of, of crayons that I carry every week and color my life with. What would you say? Man, Jesus is the biggest crayon, and I have other things I like. I think that's the healthy way we should look. But a lot of us, let's just be honest, we have a 64 crayon set, and Jesus is just one of them that we color our week with. What that tells us sometimes when that is the way it is, is that Jesus is not enough. That we need more passions in our life that are the same size as Jesus, or even possibly bigger in our life than Jesus, to function. There was a guy in, the, in uh, 1982, July 12th. This is a true story. I'm going to pull the picture up for you just in a second. His name was, you don't have to put it up yet. His name was Lon Chair Larry. Does anybody remember this guy? July 12th, 1982, Lawn Chair Larry is in the backyard of his, wife, of his girlfriend's house. Yep, there he is. And he takes his lawn chair, and he attaches it to 43 weather balloons filled with helium and a 900-foot tension rope that he is going to sail up 900 feet and in his lawn chair just hang out for a while with his beers. This is no, this is no lie. That is actually him right there going up. Lawn Chair Larry gets to 900 feet. The wind starts to blow really hard on Lawn Chair Larry. And guess what? Whack! You hear the rope snap, according to Lon Chair Larry. And the next thing he knows, he's 16,000 feet off of the ground. 16,000 feet off the ground. Put that in your mind. You fly an airplane at 30,000 feet. He was half that high up. He had no seatbelt. Not that it matters, you're in a lawn chair. But, <laughs> but he had no seatbelt. He is sitting in a lawn chair that has sandbags on the side to even out the weight and he's got weather balloons up top filled with helium and a BB gun to lower himself back down I'm not making this up <laughs> he flies over the LAX airport and his, his girlfriend you can hear it you can go out you got to go to YouTube and watch this but you can you could hear him talking to her going call the LAX airport I'm going into federal airspace and like he's flying into federal airspace he got a four thousand dollar fine for, for flying into federal airspace on a lawn chair. You ought to hear him talking with the people on the radio. It is hilarious. He's like, they're like, what kind of craft are you? And he goes, a lawn chair. <laughs> what? How are you got it in the air? Or, well, they thought he was in a hot, hot air balloon. They go, how many, you know, you got one balloon, one big balloon? He goes, no, I got 43. 43? What? 43 balloons? Yeah, 43 weather balloons. And like, it's just a crazy conversation. <laughs> About two weeks later, he is on, he is on, David Letterman. And while he's um, talking on David Letterman, he gets on there and he looks at David Letterman and he makes this statement. I have found inner peace in my life because I did this lawn chair this stunt in my, wife, in my girlfriend's backyard. And David Letterman, just like you're looking at me right now, goes, seriously, bro, you found inner peace? He's like, dude, it's what I've always wanted to do. Ever since I saw those, th those weather balloons at an army surplus store, it was like my dream. And now that my dream is fulfilled, I have lived it and I have inner peace. I mean, he's really passionate about this. You can go on and watch it. I watched it too. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, why? For the same reason that we go after crazy dreams that we, if we really step back, would realize are very frivolous in our life. Because we've missed the point that God is the one thing that will fill the void that we're looking to fill. And here's what ends up happening, doesn't it? We get in struggles in our marriage. Okay, let's just let's start there. And we're struggling in our marriage and we're fighting back and forth. And we can fill our marriage with the void that is Christ. But sometimes it's just easier to step back and be mad and say things we don't mean and do things that we don't want to do. And choose easier doors that will get us out of the situation faster. 
Instead of going to our knees and going, God, how do I need to change in order to fix this? We do the same thing with our integrity. We do the same thing with our finances. We do the same thing with um, our character before God, with our secret sins, maybe with our alcoholism or some of the things that maybe we're struggling with, like drugs or, or our sexual addiction. We go, you know, I don't know how to fix this, and I, and I don't know how to get this door open, so I'm just going to go through the easier door because at least I get a moment's worth of gratification. Jacob lived his entire life up to this point for a moment's worth of gratification. That's why they called him deceiver. That's why they called him heel catcher. He had a reputation of being a person who once, one, he was a one second wonder, man. He would live in the moment. Now, watch this. All the way through his life, this is where it's going to really relate to you. All the way through Jacob's life. God was around. Man, he had a godly father. He had a godly mother. He had moments where he met with God, but he never felt like he, put, he could push through and get into the intimate relationship with God where he was living a way that would change who he was. God was everywhere surrounding him, but nowhere in the middle filling his void. You ever feel like that? Man, I feel like I come to church. I feel like I read my Bible sometimes. I listen to 99.1. I have around people who tell me what I need to do in my life. And yet sometimes I just feel like the door is so tight to move that next step forward with God, to really walk in obedience with God, to really get to know God. I'm struggling. You, you may be this person. That was Jacob. And now Jacob finds himself on a journey to go meet back up with his brother Esau. Bad situation, because if you remember last week, what did he do to Esau? He stole his entire inheritance for a bowl of soup. Esau, at this point, probably doesn't want to go have, um, you know, a Starbucks with his brother right now. Fair statement. And here comes Esau and Jacob getting ready to meet. Jacob's scared to death, and we pick up in Genesis chapter 32, verse 22, and we're going to find it in this passage of Scripture. That same night, Jacob arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 children, and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok. Now listen to this, because this is just Jacob right here, such a weasel, okay? He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and Jacob was alone. Why do you think Jacob sent everything across the stream before him the night before? Maybe he's feeling out the waters with his brother. Well, surely he won't kill my wife and my kids. All right, he had a Bach horse clan, by the way. Did you notice that, 11 kids? Yeah, sure did. So he sent little Josh, little John, little Rachel, little Josiah, sent them all across. Maybe my brother won't kill me if I send them all over there and they see him and he has pity on me that I have 11 kids, right? You ever use that one? Anyway, just kidding. He's got his 11 kids and, and he sends them across because he is, he's a weasel his entire life. He does not want to face the consequences of the choices that he's made in his own life that have just fulfilled the definition of the deceiver name that he has. Now watch this. He finds himself alone on that side of the river, and it says a man comes up, and they have a confrontation. Now, there are some strange passages in the Bible. There are some passages in the Bible that you're not going to understand until you meet God face to face and you have a conversation. I would say this is one of them. Because there are verses in this Bible, so in this in this. this story or this recollection or this, this factual story right here that leave us to go, well, what, how did it happen? How did they get into this argument? What caused a wrestling match? Did somebody just come up and go, we shall wrestle? I mean, that, that's, that's just weird, right? But I'm going to read it to you, and then we're going to try and define what happened here. Okay, you ready? That same night he arose, he took his wives, his servants, his 11 kids, and crossed the fort of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else he had, and Jacob was alone, Okay? Now, while alone, a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Wait a minute, what? He wrestled with him until the breaking of day. That's so weird, right? But here's how I see that. Jacob is left alone, probably contemplating that his entire life at this point has been less than what he wanted it to be. He's known as a deceiver. He's known as a heel catcher. He's deceived his brother. He just went through two really hard, <laughs> two hard periods of time with a guy named Laban. He is struggling. And he's alone probably contemplating, I'm such a weasel. I just sent my brothers, or I just sent my kids and my wife in front of my brother, hoping that he won't hurt me. God, there's something that has to change. You ever been in this place? 
God, I'm tired of who I am. I'm tired of my definition. I really wish things would change. And it was like God confronted him face to face and said, are you really serious right now? Are you ready to have this conversation? And it says they wrestled until daybreak. You ever struggled with something in your soul and in your heart so long that it kept you up all night? That you prayed and you turmoiled, God, fix my situation. God, fix my relationships. God, fix my marriage. God, fix my sin struggle. God, if you don't fix it, I don't know what I'm going to do. And somewhere along the lines, for those who don't push through that door, that wrestling match with God ends prematurely. For Jacob, it went all night long. But it went a little bit farther. Let's read it. Jacob was left alone. A man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And when the man saw that he could not prevail against Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, and he put it out of joint as he wrestled with him. Now, watch this. This is huge. You ever broke a bone? Anybody ever broke a bone? Yeah? Do you want to keep fighting after you break a bone? No. No, it hurts. And you're like, ow. It hurts. I don't want to do this anymore. When when my wife and I were in ministry back in Augusta, Georgia, we were coming out of church one day, and there was a step about that big. Betsy was holding Jonah. He was maybe one year old, and she missed the step a little funny, and she tried to save not dropping Jonah, and her ankle turned like this. You can't really see it because I'm up here. But her ankle kind of turned like, you know, on the side, and when it did, her bone broke down across and when it broke down and crossed, the, the tendons, because it was turned like a rubber band, whipped it. And I looked down, and she goes, I think I hurt my ankle, and it was pointing that way. And I was like, yeah, you did. You really hurt it. <laughs> I, that's exactly what I did. I didn't know what to do. I was like, if I over freak out here, she's going to. I was like, yeah, you really hurt it. we got to go to the hospital. And I mean, and when she looked at it, it was backwards. I mean, when she saw that it was backwards, it took every bit of fight out of her. She's like, here, take the kid. Carry me to the car. I mean, you know, you're just in shock, you're hurting, you're, 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 not wondering, you're wondering what's going to happen next, how do I function past this? Now imagine you're wrestling with a guy which takes a ton of hip strength, right? If we're reading this for what it says, and all of a sudden this person that you're wrestling with, which he knows is God, touches his hip and puts it out of place. He now has hips that are disjointed, okay? That would cause excruciating pain. And he didn't stop. Let me read it. Then he said, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I'm going to go back just to read it all over again so you can see the context of it. Verse 24, Jacob was left alone. A man wrestled with him till the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he could not prevail against Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip. And Jacob's hip was put out of place as he wrestled with him. And then the man said, or then God said to him, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I don't care if my hip's broken. I don't care what's going on across the ford. I don't care what's happening with my family right now. I got one thing I need to accomplish at all costs, at any circumstance. I am not leaving until you change the definition of my life. This is where Christians fall short when they try to break through a jammed door. We will stay up and we will pray countless hours. And we will, we will change portions of our life. And we will do things that we think we can do that will make God happy so that he will change our definition. But the only thing that changed the definition of Jacob right here was that the socket of his hip. He would go through suffering that was so strong that he would forever walk with a limp. Because of the changes that God made in his life. So here's a question. Has God made such drastic changes in you that you walk differently because of it? If you do, I guarantee you, your jaw is not jammed anymore. You may have times when it's a little hard to open, but it's probably not jammed anymore. When I read this story, I think of Chris Pallardy, who is our Celebrate Recovery guy. He's the guy that leads Celebrate Recovery. Yeah, give him a little shout out. That's okay. Yeah. I think he's, he may be in here, he may be in the back. God put his hip out three years ago. He walks in here walking with a major limp. I go, what's your name? He goes, my name's Chris. I said, where's your family? Well, they left me because I have a cocaine addiction. 
And at that point, here's Chris's choice. Are you ready for his choice? To find an easier door to walk through that's not jammed and just go do crack and cocaine for the rest of his life and see where that takes him or to let God completely displace his life, recreate him, rename him, redefine him, and give him a new set of circumstances in life at any cost to him. Man, God broke his hip that, that, that year. But let me tell you what he does. He walks with a limp before people that makes them want to know Jesus. Some of you are sitting here today and you're going, man, my life is in shambles. I don't like who I am. I want God to redefine me. I want to be close to him. Then it doesn't take praying all night necessarily. It doesn't take you giving up things that you think will make God happy. It is looking at the deepest, darkest struggles of your life and saying, God, break me apart in order to remove them. And I will be a willing participant. Can we just be honest for a second? I don't think a lot of people want to be a willing participant in that party. That's hard. I mean, because we got emotions, and we got feelings, and we got pleasures, and we got wants. And to remove those things sometimes is very, very difficult, right? And so we get right up to the point, and God goes, okay, here we go, it's going to hurt. And he begins to twist the hips a little bit, and you're like, whoo, I'm out, new door, this is too tough. I'll come back, and we'll try this again sometime. And you have got to sustain in the most painful moments if you want to push the door of God open. Lawn chair, Larry. 1993, late October, walked up to the top of his favorite mountain, took a gun, put it to his heart, pulled the trigger. October 12, 1993. You know why? Because getting in a lawn chair and putting 43 weather balloons on it and filling them with healing, helium did not bring inner peace into his life. It just prolonged the turmoil. There is no door that you will walk through other than God's door that will give you what you're looking for. Let me finish this. Let me read this to you. Verse 28, then he said, Jacob, deceiver, weasel. <laughs> I can see God going, you're such a weasel, Jacob, but not anymore. For your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but it shall be called Israel. For you have strived with God and with men, and you have prevailed. You have prevailed. I have changed you. You have, pay, you have faced and paid the price that it's going to take. You have said, hey, God, at any cost, I want to come through the door. I don't care what it's going to take me to do it. Now watch this. You ready for this? What happens when you prevail, when you push through that door? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21. It's not going to be on the screen. I just want to read it to you and see if you can figure out what he's trying to say. He's talking about people of great faith. In Hebrews eleven twenty one. 21, he says, By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, Blessed each of his sons, bowing in worship while leaning on his staff. Why do you lean on a staff? Because for the rest of his life, God changed his name. And it had a mark on Jacob that would never go away. You want God to change you? then you have got to stay there, and you've got to sustain, and you've got to say, hey, God, at all costs, I want to change. And there's going to be times when you want to walk through that other door, and I just challenge you, go look at the door and come right back and just sit at the feet of Jesus and go, hey, God, I am not leaving until you change the definition of my life. Some, right now, for some of you, it feels so impossible. But you're just Jacob, maybe in a different way. And God loves you as much as he loved Jacob. And he will change you just like he changed him, just like he changed Chris. Just like he changed a 25-year-old kid named Matt Bardick who needed a lot of pride knocked out of him, so he made me lose a job. And I remember sitting in the basement going, God, I don't ever want to do this again. So just destroy me. And he did. 
and there's a rubble of ash in Lee Summit, Missouri in the basement of a tri-level house where God went to work and I will never walk the same. Did it hurt? Yeah. Do I want to go back? Sometimes. Because as God twisted my hips, I never felt so close to him at all, in all my life. Some of you, you need to feel God so much. But you're afraid of the pain. And I'm just here to tell you, it's, it's, it's not pain like you think in a, in a human form. It's a changing, morphing, he's redesigning you kind of pain. And it's good. Will you do me a favor? Will you bow your head and close your eyes? You may be sitting here today and you just feel like Jacob. Because for too long you have danced with so many doors, walking in and out of them, but never feeling like you could push through the door of God. And you've made these promises, oh God, I'm going to change. But change never happens for you because you never want to get to the point where he can do whatever he wants with your life. And you're at this point right now where you're going, I am ready to let God do whatever he wants. I give you permission, God. Think about that statement before you really pray it. But God, I give you permission to do whatever it is you need to do and want to do in my life in order to fix what's broken, in order to change my definition. If that is you, I want to pray for you. Will you raise your hand? Just raise them high. If that's you. If you raised your hand, can I just encourage you? The days ahead are going to get hard. And you're going to need people around you that love you. But I just challenge you, do not leave that doorway until God has redefined who you are. How does that look when he redefines you? He identifies what hurts and what is holding you back. He asks you to remove it. He may expose you of the struggle that you have so that he can help you remove it. There may be a painful journey ahead. I'm just, I'm just being honest with you. But I promise you when he's done, he will redefine who you are. And like we talked a long time ago in Joel, he will restore what the moths have eaten in your life. I want to pray for you. Dear Jesus, I just pray for these people who were honest and said, God, I, I am so tired of the slam shut door. I need you to change who I am. I just pray, God, that you would not let them go, that you would hold them tight, that you would grasp them like never before, that you would engage them in a wrestling match that would not stop until they were changed, until they were marked, until they were different. You may be sitting in here right now and say, Matt, I don't have a relationship with Jesus at all. And I, I don't know why, but I feel him calling me right now and I want one. And if you want to know how to have a relationship with Christ, I simply want you to do one thing. I want you to raise your hand. And I'm not going to point you out. I'm going to invite you to go get a Coke and we're just going to talk. Matt, I want to know how to know Christ. Just raise your hand up high and leave it there for a second so I can see you. Okay. Anyone else? Just leave them up so I can see him. Now, if you raise your hand, will you be brave and just make eye contact with me? Fill out a card. We'll sit down this week and we'll talk. Okay? Father God, we're all Jacobs. <laughs> but by your grace, you change us. You rename us. Father, I pray that you do a major renaming in this room this week, this year. So that we all have destinies that we lean on our staff and say, I remember when God redefined my life.